everybody, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Miles Thacker, I'm the Education Advisor here at Fulbright Columbian, and one of three Education USA advisors in the Bogota area, and one of 11 in all of Columbia. Uh, today I have a university webinar, uh, University of New Mexico, and I have two very special guests with us today, Nicole Taney, um, as well as uh, Ramiro Jordan. So, do you want to introduce yourself? Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Um, I am the Executive Director of Global Education Initiatives at the University of New Mexico, and I look forward to speaking with you today. I'm Ramiro Jordan, I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Engineering, responsible for global initiatives, and I'm also the Associate Chair of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Wonderful. So, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Remember, if you all have any questions, you can write them in the questions box, and we can answer those questions at the end of the webinar. We can answer those questions. If you have questions and you'd like to write them in Spanish, that's fine. Uh, Ramiro here is bilingual and also speaks Spanish. Um, so you're welcome to write your questions in English or Spanish today. <laughs> so welcome, we're going to present some information in general what it takes to study engineering in the U.S. And then we'll say a little bit of the, the University of New Mexico and the state of New Mexico. Uh, there's the picture of both of us. We already introduced ourselves, so we can go forward. So why study engineering? What do you think is important to study engineering? Well, it's interesting what it says that in, the, in the slide, but we are right now facing major global challenges, uh, climate change, water issues, air pollution, poverty, transparency, energy. These are issues that require a new way of thinking, new way of doing engineering. And not only engineers need to step up to the plate and come up with solutions, we also need to have um, involvement of other disciplines. So this, this is more of a transdisciplinary now approach. All these global challenges are independent of your uh, national anthem and flag. We're all in this together. So it has to, we have to have a global collaboration of problem solving and uh, a new way of uh, doing engineering. So the challenges are, are out there. So where do you fit? What kind of engineering do you want to do? So these are some of the engineering that, areas that we have at UNM. It doesn't mean that they're going to continue to exist in the next four years. Things are happening so fast. We don't know if mechanical engineering would exist in the next four years or five years. But so this is what we have right now, this is what most academic institutions have. And, and then we got to start somewhere. So we have electrical and computer engineering, nuclear engineering, so on and so forth. So uh, we have uh, chemical and biological engineering. These are some of the sub areas that people work on, bioengineering, pharmaceuticals, materials processing. We do a lot of uh, cancer research. We are developing new drugs using nanotechnology. Something that's very interesting about New Mexico is we have a unique cancer center very specialized in the Hispanic population because cancer with Hispanics is different. So the drugs are different, treatments are different. And in all these uh, engineering areas, you'll see at the top starting salary. Those are salaries if you would live in the US, average starting salary uh, uh, for a chemical and biological engineer. We also have civil construction and environmental engineering. Again, there's a the base salary at the top. And these are some of the sub areas that they that work. We have a very unique world water resource center, uh, water treatment. We, we have to deal with flood control. These are something that we live in New Mexico. 
we are deeply concerned about the environment. We have to look at new materials. We have a very unique 3D printing center at the, the civil engineering department where we can do 3D printing and produce any kind of brick or different type of structure using a very sophisticated 3D printer. Next, we have, of course, computer science. Uh, it's a little bit different. Many of the universities, computer science is not part of the engineering school. In our case, they're part of the school of engineering. They're also, you can see the average starting salary and some of the areas that uh, they work. Of course, AI, machine learning, life, it's very important. It's hot topic, and uh, this is something that's been going on since 1954, but all of a sudden has caught the attention of, of everybody because of what we have seen with what the big companies can do, like Google, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon. They can, uh, you have to be careful with this, they can manipulate how you behave. Um, next, we have uh, electrical and computer engineering. This is where I work, I'm the associate chair, starting salary also, is, that is if you live in the US, starting salary for the bachelor of science will be up close to 70,000. These are some of the areas that we work on. We have the, work very closely with the Mine Institute, this is a very unique center in the U.S. where we're mapping the human brain. We do a lot of virtual reality. We do a lot of high-performance computing because we're trying to model uh, different uh, human behavior, uh, mobility. Uh, we're big time also involved in smart cities and uh, cybersecurity. Mechanical engineering, uh, again, there's a base salary for an engineer just graduate from school. Uh, they work in very interesting areas like artificial limbs, of course, smart vehicles, also that means rockets, uh, fluid mechanics, uh, biotech, there's a connection between mechanical engineering, electrical computer engineering, and biological engineering. So we all work together. Uh, New Mexico, we have close to 300 days of sunshine. So solar is very, very, you know, we are top in solar and robotics manufacturing. Um, we have a nuclear engineering uh, department. There are very few schools that have a nuclear engineering department, but one of the few. Uh, that's the, start, again, starting a salary. Uh, a lot of uh, attention is placed in safety and uh, uh, management. Uh, of course, high performance computing, everything now is modeled. You don't need to uh, do crazy things now. Everything can be modeled. Um, there's a lot of uh, research and new reactors and, and their safety, and also high energy charge particle. You can read the rest of the areas. This is some of the so yeah, um, this is Nicole speaking. Um, I'd like to give you now some general information about research, public research institutions, which the UNM, uh, the University of New Mexico, excuse me, is one of. If you are considering a degree in the field of engineering, it's really important that you look for a high research university. And in the United States, those are often listed as R1, Research One Universities, which means they have a very high volume of research being produced at that institution. Um, engineering is critical to be at the cutting edge of what is happening. And so if you pick a teaching institution versus a research institution, you may get some good fundamental basics, but you're not gonna be uh, involved in any kind of research. And increasingly, uh, public universities are creating opportunities for under, undergraduate students to do research uh, while they get their degrees. And certainly, if you're interested in pursuing a master's or a doctorate degree, it will be an expectation that you work in a lab or involved in some other kind of research. Why should you think about attending a university in the Southwest? Well, uh, the United States is a very large country. Often you hear about institutions on the East or West Coast. Um, and I'm here to tell you that there's some really strong institutions in the Southwest region of the United States that include schools in Arizona and Texas, Colorado, Oklahoma, and of course in New Mexico, where we are from. Uh, often the tuition rates 
are more competitive uh, than they are on the East Coast, West Coast. Certainly the standard of living is cheaper. So all of your uh, incidental costs related to the food you eat and your transportation and your lodging is gonna be more affordable um, at a public university in the United States uh, if you're looking at the Southwest region of the country. So we encourage you as you're looking for places to pursue your degree to be um, very open to areas that you might not have heard of before because there are opportunities in the Southwest, particularly because of our historical linkages. Um, all of the states that you see highlighted uh, on this map have large Spanish speaking populations. So you'll see communities uh, where the language and the culture has certainly influenced um, the state and the region. And that is certainly true for Albuquerque where uh, the University of New Mexico is housed. Um, we also often have scholarships that are geared towards Hispanic communities. Uh, we have one of the oldest um, consulates in New Mexico because of our relationship with Mexico, for example. There are special scholarships for Mexican students in the Southwest that don't exist in other parts of the country, and those often extend to students from Latin America. So it's important that you explore all of your options as you're looking for places to study in the U.S. So who has heard of New Mexico? I, um, I wish I could see your hands, um, but often we're mistaken for um, a city in Mexico. So we have a slogan in New Mexico, which is that it's not new and it's not Mexico. Uh, we have a strong history, however, of collaboration and uh, historical ties to Central and South America. We are uh, at the top of the Camino Real, which extended down through Mexico, of course, and are also at the crossroads of Route 66. So of those of you who know about US history, we are at an important crossroads historically, which means that we have long ties to um, Hispanic communities, as well as the very thriving presence of Native American communities. Uh, New Mexico used to be described as a tri-cultural state. That is no longer the case because the cultural influences now go way beyond the Hispanic, Anglo, and Native communities. Um, outside of English, the most common spoken language in New Mexico is Spanish. And the third most common spoken language is Vietnamese. So there's a thriving immigration population in Albuquerque um, and throughout the state. Just briefly, some benefits of attending a public institution I mentioned very briefly. Our tuition prices are much more competitive than they are on either the East or West Coast. The money that you save in tuition will allow you to have other educational experiences, including studying abroad somewhere outside of the United States as an international student. Or we also have domestic exchanges, which allow you to study at another university in the United States for a semester or a year at a time, while still remaining a student at the University of New Mexico. So as you're looking at different schools in the Southwest, consider the money that you can save to do other things, to travel um, during your breaks or on weekends, money to fly home to visit family over the holidays. You have to think of, um, your educational experience in terms of the budget that you have and the sorts of things that you're going to be able to afford yourself while there. And so looking at a university that has competitive pricing, that has a diverse student body, um, are important things. The other thing is most public institutions have vast resources because they have multiple different colleges that are funded um, through internal and external funds. So public institutions are often places where you will have an opportunity um, to have a both curricular experience in the classroom in terms of your education, but also co-curricular, co excuse me, activities, which are all of those things that you do outside of the classroom that are much more broad than when you're going to a small institution that doesn't have the same amount of resources. So, you know, the gym that you can go to, the housing options that you have, the meal options that you have, but also some of the recreational activities that the school offers will be much broader at a public institution. Okay, and now the biggest question is, how do you pay for your studies? I know that that's a challenge for all students uh, in the US and of course outside of the US. Uh, the best thing is to do is to find a scholarship. And I would encourage you to treat 
uh, your scholarship search as a job. There are opportunities within your home country that you should be looking at, local, national government scholarships, nonprofit organizations, community partners, but there are also scholarships available at your host country at the national level and mostly at the institutional level, as well as organizations that may be religious based or nonprofit. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. The different types of scholarships that exist, there are, of course, government scholarships that can be offered by uh, your home government or also your host government. In this case, we're being hosted today in the Fulbright office and they have marvelous funding opportunities, particularly at the graduate level. Uh, often there are specialized funding available based on the uh, field that you plan to go into or the discipline. Um, professional agencies um, and organizations will sometimes offer scholarships, so start getting connected to those organizations early on during your undergraduate studies because there are engineering scholarships for women, for example. Um, there are uh, political science scholarships. Uh, if you're looking to do government work, sometimes there's government uh, scholarships that will push you into a particular discipline that will make you more competitive to work in the government later. So start to look at all of those opportunities early. The institutional scholarships are the most common and the most readily, readily available scholarships for international students. So I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities available in the state of New Mexico. We have something called the New Mexico Competitive Scholarship, which is actually based on a lottery earnings. Um, and so the state allocates a certain amount of money each year that is generated through a lottery and sets that aside for education. And some of that is set aside for international students as well. Both the University of New Mexico and New Mexico State University, which is a, a university to the south of us, have scholarships that they give to international students. And what that scholarship does is it allows you to pay in-state tuition instead of out-of-state non-resident tuition. And that is a savings of well over 12,000 US dollars a year. Um, Non-monetary scholarships, uh, including the Amigo Scholarship, which is this in-state tuition waiver, is usually a discount, so there's no physical money changing hands. The tuition that you owe will be reduced by the university. Um, but there are monetary scholarships uh, which students receive. Sometimes um, they're given out for housing or living costs. And so one thing to be aware of is that when you are in the United States, any money that you receive is often taxable. So those are details that you'll have to think about once you actually receive a scholarship. But please know that you may get a stipend for $1,500 a month, but once that is taxed, it might be slightly less. So as you're doing your budget, be aware that you may owe taxes e either before you actually get the stipend or at the end of the year when tax season is due. This is just a brief overview to give you a sense. This is the cost of attendance at the University of New Mexico if you're interested in an engineering degree, which is what we're talking about today. You'll see the resident rate is what applies for in-state students. Non-resident is for out-of-state and international students. However, if you are the recipient of an Amigo scholarship, which is the um, scholarship I was just speaking about, you would fall into the resident rate and you see that the category is much cheaper. Uh, the in-state tuition rate is, is uh, just over $7,000 annually, where the out-of-state and international rate is $22,000. So it's a significant savings if you get an Amigo scholarship. The other um, expenses that you see listed in this graph are all uh, estimates based on mid-range pricing. So when it comes, for example, to living in university dormitories, there are very basic dormitories that require you to share a bedroom, and then there are very high-end apartment-style dormitories where you have a kitchen and a private bedroom and a private bathroom, and of course there are price differences based on those options. So you can take a more economical room or you can have a higher-end, more expensive room, and that will change the cost. So this is a mid-range projection or estimate of what a student might pay. Um, so as well as the other um, expenses that are listed. So if you want more information about how we got to these figures, we can let you know, but this should be sort of a ballpark estimation of what it would cost for one annual year of um, tuition based on whether you're getting the in-state or the out-of-state rate. 
Most of the scholarships that international students have access to are merit-based scholarships. So that means your performance will determine your level of eligibility. Often uh, to apply for a merit scholarship, you often have to provide a transcript of your grades. There may be test scores involved that you're asked to provide. Um, and there are honors associations, again, that are either national or local that also offer merit-based scholarships that are important to look into. The other thing that's usually um, a part of scholarships, merit scholarships, is that you'll be asked for letters of recommendation. And it's really important that you take these seriously because your recommenders have the power to either bump you up and sort of help highlight your strengths, or they can also make you look bad if they don't take the time to really write um, about you personally. So we have some recommendations here. Um, usually you'll be asked for a letter of recommendation from a professor or a former employer, a teacher that you had, a mentor. It's really important that you provide that instructor, mentor, professor information about the scholarship that you're applying for. Share a resume or CV, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, give them as much information as you can about yourself so that they have information to draw upon. You may even want to give them, you know, in the email, a bullet list of things that they could consider to include in the letter about your academic background and success. In some cases, you may also be asked to submit a letter of recommendation that's a personal recommendation, which could be a family member, a friend, a community member, sometimes someone from your church, even a pastor, who can attest to your character as an individual, your involvement perhaps with a community project or a community church or other things that you might have done that highlight who you are as an individual. You know, the one tip I would say is approach people early. Usually people in leadership positions are busy and they will not think kindly of you if you ask them for a letter and tell them you need it in two days, right? Um, because they may be too busy to write it for you. So give them weeks, if not months of warning and make sure that you remind them that they agreed to write a letter for you. And I think the last tip I would have is always ask someone, would you be able and willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation? And if someone has reservations, then I would recommend that you ask someone else because you only want people representing you who are truly um, able to present you in a positive light. Letters of intent are also very common. So those are letters where you describe what your interest is, why you feel you're qualified for the scholarship or why you're applying for a specific degree program or even why you're applying to a specific university. You should talk about what you've already done, why you're interested in that scholarship or that program and what you plan to do with the opportunity if you're given the scholarship or if you're admitted to the program. It's very important here to be specific. Nobody wants to read a generic letter. So if you're applying to four or five institutions, which is recommended, make sure that you personalize and customize your letter of intent to each institution. Because if you write the same thing, it will become very clear to the reader that you haven't done your homework. So Dr. Hordan represents the School of Engineering at UNM and they have certain specializations. They have faculty working on very specific projects. What I would recommend that you do if the University of New Mexico is something you may be interested in is start to look at the faculty profiles, read the type of research that's happening and then say, oh, I would love to work with this and this person because he or she is working on the following topics. And that shows the committee that will be reviewing your letter that you have taken a sincere interest in that particular program and it will make you more interesting and competitive as a student. The other form of scholarship is an assistantship and those are often the most coveted types of support at the graduate level and those are often given out most commonly to doctoral or PhD students. That means that you're working for a certain number of hours either as a research assistant in a lab or teaching, helping to teach an undergraduate class, or you're performing a specific administrative function in a program that a department may be running. It's not unlike work study, 
Um, but the thing to remember is that you are gaining valuable information and valuable insights that will make you more competitive when you complete your degree. So while you may have to spend 15 or 20 hours a week working in a lab or teaching or grading or supporting professor in some other capacity, you're gaining expertise that will set you apart once you have a degree because you will have practical experience outside of the academic and classroom experience. So again, it's important to know your university. If you plan to apply to an assistantship, look at the kind of work that's happening and talk about how your past experience or at least your interest would contribute to that research. And that will make you more competitive as faculty decide who gets the assistantships for that year. The application process to for an assistantship is different at each university. Um, sometimes it's combined with your application, and that is the case at the University of New Mexico. When you apply for a graduate um, admission to the university, it will ask you if you're interested in financial assistance and in an assistantship, and you can click yes, and it will give you some other instructions. Certain schools, that application process is different. So please inform yourself. Again, if you're applying to multiple institutions, make sure that you understand the process at each university. The deadlines might be slightly different. The process for applying may be different. There will be similarities. Each place will ask you probably for some sort of recommendation letter as well as a personal essay or narrative or a letter of intent. Remember to customize it and to change the name of the institution. I have seen this mistake again and again that students apply to multiple institutions and they will write the name of one university and send it to the wrong one. I guarantee you it's the easiest way to get thrown out of the competition. So make sure that you proofread, make sure that you ask someone in your family or your mentor or professor to look at the letter so that there's a second pair of eyes. Um, sometimes Fulbright offices have opportunities for students to come and talk to a counselor advisor and they help them with those kinds of services. Um, so make sure that you know the timing and that you keep on top of the information and that you submit everything ahead of time. One key important factor is that many universities have rolling deadlines for financial aids and assistantships. And those students that are competitive that apply early are guaranteed funding, much more likely to be guaranteed funding than those who apply late. Because once the money is given away and once the assistantships have been assigned, even if you're very bright and you have high test scores and you're talented, if there's no money to give away, there's simply no money. So apply early and pay attention to those preferred deadlines. There's a sample timeline right there on your screen, and that's a very common timeline for most public research universities, but make sure you look at the ones you're applying to and get the exact dates. Okay, another common thing that you're asked to submit along with your application often, especially for a graduate program, is a CV or a resume. CV stands for curriculum vitae. Um, they serve similar functions, but they're slightly different. A CV tends to be much longer. They can be up to 30, 40 pages, depending on how you know, far along you are in your career. They'll list publications, conference talks, teaching experience, projects you're working on. And resumes tend to be much shorter. It's an overview of the work that you've done. They tend to be outside of academia. But recently, I've seen sort of a merging of the resume and CV, where people send a combination or what they call a short CV. So they're giving you a little bit of both. So make sure it's always okay to ask questions and say, what's your preference? Or is there a page limit to the CV or to the resume? Always inform yourself so that you're sending in the right document and you know how much space you have to represent the work you've done. If you don't know what a resume or CV may look like or the fact that CVs and resumes look very different depending on what country you're in, Look up some sample resumes or CVs online to get an idea because there are certain things that are not legal on resumes in the United States, but they are in Europe, for example. You don't put in a photo, you don't put your date of birth. Um, there are certain things that are not included in American or, or CVs and resumes used in the United States that are required 
in other parts of the world. So just make sure that you know how that works because we have received resumes or CVs from international students with dates of birth and with photos. And those are actually things we're not allowed to consider um, because of equality laws and diversity laws, which don't allow us to discriminate based on age or gender or uh, ethnic or racial background. Okay, and I will uh, talk briefly about this and maybe ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Hordan to um, give some advice here too, but it's always important, as I said, to do your homework and to connect early with the administrators and faculty in the programs that you're interested in. But before you do that, you should do your homework. If you've heard of a particular professor who's working on a project or a research area that you're interested in, look up their website, read one of their papers, um, and get a sense of what they're doing before you contact them, because then you will have some actual information to share with them about what it is that you appreciate about their work. Remember to use formal communication when you email them, introduce yourself, tell them who you are, address a professor formally, either Professor Hordan or Dr. Hordan. You never want to reach out to someone you don't know and be overly informal, um, especially if you're requesting something of them, right? You're asking them to possibly consider you for an assistantship or to consider you for um, participation in a project or entry into a degree program. So try to put your best foot forward by being formal, but don't be so formal that you're afraid to approach them. No, yeah, that's correct. I think you have to be persistent. Uh, we're all busy and uh, drop the ball. So you need to be persistent and make sure to catch the attention of that faculty or research. And again, one good way to do that is not to be too general or generic. If you send the same email to five faculty member and you copy them all off, nobody's gonna answer. People don't wanna feel like they're getting spammed. And if you send the same email to 10 people, nobody's gonna answer because they're gonna feel like it's not personal to them. So be very specific with how you reach out to people. Um, try to be intentional with the information and with the questions you ask. And if you don't hear back after maybe a week or 10 days, please email again and say, good afternoon. I'm writing to follow up on the email I sent you a week ago. Um, I'm still interested in possibly speaking with you. It's okay to nudge and to be um, persistent as long as you remain polite. Uh, please understand that you're not gonna get an email response within a day or two. That's unlikely if a professor is busy. Give somebody a week to two weeks and then try again. So that shows again that you have to start this process early. If there's an application deadline, let's say of January 15th, don't start emailing people in early January because they will be gone for the holidays and it will be too late. Make sure you're talking to people in September, October, getting information early on that you can include in your application. Um, and it is very likely that your uh, ability to impress a particular department or school or professor will increase if you've shown a genuine interest in that particular institution or that particular department. Beyond scholarships, not all of us are, you know, lucky enough to receive scholarships. Sometimes you get it for one year, but not the next. There are student loans available, and depending on um, you know, your interest in, in studying, you may want to consider a loan either in your home country or now there are increasingly areas in the United States, private companies in the United States that are starting to give loans to international students, which is a rather new development because you used to have to be a U.S. citizen or have a U.S. citizen co-sign loans, but there are private uh, funding agencies that are starting to make educational loans available for international students. This would not be my first cho choice for any student because you have to pay back the money and sometimes the interest rates can be quite high. It's important to ask things like whether the loan is deferred or undeferred. Um, and that means if you have a deferred loan, which is preferable, that you will not start to accumulate interest until you finished your degree, which means in the end you will owe less than if you start to accumulate interest at the time that you're studying. So there's some important questions to ask if you're considering loans 
There's some resources at the bottom of the screen where there are funding opportunities, both scholarships and other funding opportunities listed for international students looking to study in the United States. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Finally, especially if you're considering a loan, but also if you're accepting a, a scholarship, it's really important to know what you're signing on for. In some cases, if it's a recurring scholarship, you will be asked to, to have certain deliverables. You have to maintain a certain grade point average. For example, at UNM, the minimum grade point average you have to have to maintain an Amigo scholarship is a 3.0, which is about a B average. You may have to participate in specific community service, or there may be a home residency degree, I'm sorry, a home residency requirement after you complete your degree in your home country. Um, there may be specific courses that you're required to take that are perhaps not related to your degree program, but related to the scholarship that you've received. So make sure that you know what it is you're signing on for before you sign your name at the bottom of that contract, because any loan agreement or any scholarship agreement is a contract that binds you to certain things. The other thing that I want to say again is the tax implications. You as a foreign student are subject to, to local tax regulations. And so it's important to think about that early because we have had students at our university and elsewhere that end up having tax liabilities that they didn't know about. And at the end of the year, they owe money that they should have been paying throughout the year. And if you're paying a little bit every month, it's much easier than if you're trying to pay at the end of the year. Um, all at once. That can be very stressful. So just make sure that you know what's being asked of you. And the last thing I would say is no credible scholarship will ever ask you to pay in order to apply. Though if you're being asked to apply in order to be eligible for, if you're at, being asked to pay money when you apply for a scholarship, it's very likely to be a scam. And unfortunately, there are scams out there in the world that are looking to take advantage of international students. So make sure that it's a reputable, reputable scholarship and that you are not being asked to pay any money up front in order to qualify for a scholarship. Okay, we have listed some resources here for you in the end, and it's my understanding that you have the ability to download this PowerPoint. So I would definitely do that because some of these are hyperlinks that you can check out as time permits. We would like to spend a little time now um, answering your questions. We're going to see what kinds of questions came through as we were chatting, and both I and uh, Dr. Horgan would be more than happy to expand on some of the points we've made or answer any questions that might have popped up for you as you were listening to this presentation that we just gave. Yeah, so if you all have any questions, now's the time. Um, you can just go ahead and write that in the questions box. Si ustedes tienen preguntas, ustedes pueden escribir las preguntas en la caja de preguntas. As we're waiting for the questions to come in, I'll add that um, doing your homework really helps you to figure out where you want to end up and which institution is the right fit for you. In addition to looking at things like academic programs and the type of research being done by faculty that you hope to work with and the kind of scholarships that are available at that institution, also consider lifestyle. Um, you know, if you come from a country where there is no snow, um, maybe you're interested in moving somewhere where it can get very cold and where there's snow because that's something you're curious about. Or you may not be interested at all in moving anywhere where there's snow and the winters are very cold. So do some homework and look at what is the climate like in the state where you're looking to apply. Um, how much sunshine do you have? you know, around the year. Um, what kinds of other interesting things are happening? New Mexico is a high desert. We have uh, four seasons, um, but our winters are very short. We have about 360 days of sunshine a year. Um, and there's a lot of outdoor recreational activities, a lot of hiking, um, a lot of, there's skiing opportunities in the winter, but it's just a place where people like to be outside and they like to, 
um, do bird watching, they like to do mountain biking, they, I mean, there's a vast uh, recreational network. Um, so if you're someone who likes to be outdoors, that's a place to be. Um, you know, there's folks who like to be near water. So you should look for, you know, institutions that are, you know, on one of the bodies of water or near a big lake. So remember that anybody doing a degree uh, is going to be in that particular place for two to six years, depending on your degree study. So make sure you know a little something about the place you're going and that it's a place that you feel like you're going to be able to succeed and be happy. So Nicole, um, we're still waiting for questions. Uh, I have a question. I know a lot, uh, especially our current nominees for our scholars and, and other um, prospective students for graduate school programs are wondering what the minimum TOEFL and GRE scores are in general uh, for your programs. Sure, I'm happy to, uh, to share that information. Um, it's slightly different whether you're interested in the undergraduate level or the graduate level. Mm -hmm. um, I will give the um, graduate level scores first. Um, because I, I suspect that with um, the Fulbright grantees that you have, that they're all uh, looking at graduate programs, either masters or PhDs. So UNM currently accepts um, three language proficiency exams, and that is the graduate TOEFL, the IELTS, and the PTE. Mm -hmm. um, for the graduate TOEFL, uh, the internet-based, we require a 79. For the paper-based exam of 550. Oh, so you you accept the TOEFL ITP? Yes. Okay. Very interesting because some of uh, a lot of people in Colombia, especially because it's um, more accessible, uh, take the TOEFL ITP, and not all universities accept the paper-based. So that's good to know. So 550 in the ITP. Mm -hmm. We also have certain other exceptions that are not listed on our website, but if, for example, you went to an undergraduate university where the curriculum was in entirely in English, if you can provide evidence of that and you communicate with us, we may be able to waive the English language exam. So I know that there are some American universities and other programs around the world, um, particularly sometimes there's high schools that are American or British based. And we will waive if we have evidence of um, a student completing successfully a degree. Uh, we also have some other exceptions listed on our website. Uh, if you are an international student who's gotten an undergraduate degree, for example, at a US institution, or you were living in a country where there was the national language was English, we also waive those requirements. Um, so those usually just require communication with my office. And we have a list of English speaking countries um, where we will waive uh, the TOEFL exam. Okay. We are also currently, and this is not available yet um, because it's an extended process, but looking for opportunities to accept additional English language programs or exams, rather, sorry, including the Duolingo. But it'll be uh, some time before we can put that on our books because it has to go through faculty approval. But we are working on getting other exams that are more accessible and more affordable onto our um, admissions list. Wonderful, thank you, Nicole. And uh, for the GRE, I know it's an engineering school, so maybe you're looking at the quantitative scores a little bit more. Um, do you have like a, a, an idea of the range that you're looking for? For the, I'm sorry, for which quantitative scores? For the quantitative for GRE. Um, that will depend on the program itself. Okay. So in terms of the TOEFL score, let me back up just a little and say our basic admission um, requirements are what I read to you. There may okay. be certain programs, especially at the graduate level, that have slightly higher requirements, but um, these are our base requirements. The same thing for the GRE is that I would say it makes most sense to look at the actual graduate program because the score requirements depend on the graduate admission team for that mm -hmm. college or department. I did see that we have some questions coming in here. Uh, there was, are the Fulbright and Amigo scholarships compatible? Yes, and I'll tell you that um, we annually reserve a certain number of Amigo scholarship for Fulbright recipients. So what the Amigo scholarship would do is it would allow 
uh, an in-state tuition rate rather than out-of-state. And if you are a Fulbright grantee, the likelihood of you getting an Amigo scholarship is significantly higher than if you are an applicant who is applying without a Fulbright scholarship. Okay, what percentage of international applicants do you accept and do you encourage diversity? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, we have an incredibly diverse international student population. It is not a huge population, but it is very diverse. So we have about 1,500 international students at the University of New Mexico currently, and we don't have any one nationality that dominates that. Our top nationalities include Nepal, Iran, India, China, and South Korea. However, we have students from all over the world um, from about 99 different countries. It wavers between 101 and 99, and quite a few of those are from uh, Latin and Central America. Um, so diversity is something that we uh, consider truly important. We are a Hispanic serving institution, and we are a minority serving institution. And what that means is that at least 50% of our students are considered minorities. And in the US context, that means that they are uh, either of a Hispanic or Latino background, African American, Native American, Asian American, non-white basically. So our campus is about 50% non-white. And many of our international students consider themselves as part of that uh, community, absolutely. Do we have any more questions? If not, we can close up. Uh, remember, if you missed anything, you can always visit our YouTube page, our Fulbright YouTube page, um, and view the webinar another time. Um, and also, if you'd like to download the this presentation, you can um, through the GoToWebinar panel. You have a download there, and you're welcome to download that. So in closing, I just want to say that we would be excited to hear from any of you to answer your questions in more detail um, on the contact page. Just prior to this one, we listed the general information for my office and also some specific contacts for the School of Engineering. Um, but if you look me up, um, Nicole Tommy, you have my name at the beginning of the um, presentation. You will also find my email uh, there in, in the university website, and I'd be happy to chat with you if you refer or reference this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole and uh, Ramiro, for joining us today. That was really nice, very comprehensive, um, especially those tips for applying for uh, schools in general. Um, very, very useful information. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, it's for great to be here. Us. And thank you here, here in, in Colombia. <laughs> It's great to be here. Thank you. If you're interested in going to UNM, please reach out to us. All the best. Thank you. Mm -hmm.